Good Monday morning of the second week of Advent. These are some of the most beautiful readings, prophetic readings, especially Isaiah. Isaiah is eloquent, there's no other way. And the picture he presents is a picture of beautiful redemption. It's making whole, it's bringing everything together. And you can see the gospels in many ways capture the imagery that Isaiah presents. The, the messianic promise. He captured, see the prophets were the geniuses because the, what they saw wasn't they were predicting the future as such. What they were seeing is the presence of God in every aspect of life and they articulated. They were essentially seers who spoke, if that makes sense to you. I think it's the role of the church. It's the prophetic role of the church. Not gonna pull any miracles off or anything like that. It's, it's to, as it were, to see the truth the, the true Christian, to see Christ in the world, especially in the suffering world, and make whole and heal the brokenness of the world. See, I think of that. When I think of the church in these roles, but the imagery of life, and this, I want to read it to you, Isaiah, okay? It's, uh, it's the 35th chapter of Isaiah. God, could this guy write or what? Or whoever he was, whether it was Isaiah, one of his disciples. I don't know how the prophets worked, you know, but I know that usually not a single person, but a school. It's like the Platonic or the Aristotelian school. It's not that Plato wrote everything and Isaiah, I mean, um, Aristotle wrote everything, but they have schools of thought and they capture the name of it. They carry the name, something like that. Okay, but here, let me read it to you. And the imagery is it's an appeal to the imagery of Moses crossing the desert, where dependence on God is essential. You ain't gonna make it in the desert without the guidance and the presence of God. It's Moses leading him across the desert because he is following God. You see, God is the real leader. See, he, Moses is the spokesman, is the leader commissioned by God to cross, to lead his people across the desert. The desert, the wilderness. I'm going to share a thought with you. I've been a million times before, but I'll share a thought with you. The, the wilderness and the ocean have a similarity, powerful similarity. They are both beyond human control. You go in the wilderness, you know it's bigger than you are by vast amounts. <laughs> you know you're a creature when you're in the wilderness. Been there and got the T-shirt. Trust me, go to Alaska sometime. Don't go by some tourist guide. Get somebody, some a real guide, hunting guide, somebody like that who takes you out into the wilderness and you know how vast it is. It's beyond your imagination. I remember one fellow who was taking me. Uh, I, he's a member of Boone and Crockett like myself. Uh, his name is Tom Leifshire. And I said, Tom, I never want you out of my sight. <laughs> I could get lost in the, in the sacristy. Out here, they'd never find me. <laughs> you know, that's a, And the ocean is the same. If you grow up on the water like I did, you, you, when you grow up on the water like I did, Long Island Sound as it opens up into the Atlantic, you respect the water. You realize you cannot control it. Hence, you learn to respect it. You respect the tides and the wind, the sky. You watch the sky. I think I told you that already. Trust me, trust me. You don't risk anything against the ocean. She's bigger than you are. She'll swallow you up. <laughs> That's the truth. But if you respect her, she's beautiful. See, she's beautiful. I love the ocean. Much more than a lake. The ocean has the sense of power and beauty combined. But power and beauty, if not respected, is lethal. And that's the desert. So let me read it to you. I've now wasted all this time. Uh, the desert and the parched land will exult. It will come alive, you see. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will, not the desert, the symbol of life will flourish. It'll come alive, you see. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. What a beautiful thought. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. 
Then will the lame leap like a stag. Then the tongue of the mute will sing. Streams will burst forth in the desert. Can you imagine that? Desert is bone dry and all of a sudden you have fresh water and rivers in the steppe. The burning sands will become pools and the thirsty ground springs of water. The abode where jackals lurk will be a marsh for the reed and the papyrus. A highway will be there called the Holy Way. And no one unclean may pass over it, nor fools go astray on it. No lion will be there, nor beast of prey go up to be met upon. It is for those with a journey to make. I think of life, and on it the redeemed will walk. I think of the image of walking. I love that image personally. See, we walk in life. We journey, we walk. See? Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sour, sorrow and mourning will flee. That's my image of paradise. To be with those, see, they will meet with joy that we will be together again in paradise. Who? Those we have loved and been loved by. And there will be no longer sorrow, nor mourning, no more loss, only life. Life, and love, and the communion of intimacy formed through intimacy, communion of life and love. Somebody asked me what I thought of paradise, and I said, being with my family and my friends, whom I have loved and been loved by. I've told you that already a lot of times. I mean it. I love this Isaiah prophecy. I love it. See, the, the desert is a symbol of life and death. The wilderness, life and death. Teeming with life, also death. And if all you have is the desert, you ain't going to make it. And you see, he turns the desert of life, its vast emptiness, into something that is flourishing with water and life, you see. And that's a powerful image. I know the wilderness. I don't know the desert, but I do know the wilderness. And I know it's both entrancing, but it's also intimidating. And you have to have a guide. You have to have a kind. You can't do it alone. Like I said to my friend Tom, Tom, I don't want you out of my sight. In the crossing of life, I don't want Christ out of my sight. I have to keep my eyes on Christ. He's walking in front of me or alongside, but he's definitely not behind me because I wouldn't be walking without him. I couldn't be walking without the church. Not in any pious sense, but the wisdom of the church over thousands of years of reflection, going back to the prophets, the church knows the wilderness. She knows the desert. She knows how to walk across it. See? I love the image of Moses and the, you know, the, the early prophets, because they were rough and tough guys. Moses was rough and tough, okay? And I think the apostles were that way, too. They were working stiffs. But they got the church across the desert. Moses got the Jews across the desert. He brought them redemption. And the, the apostles brought us Christ. And the successors of the apostles bring us Christ. With all their fallibility and their infallibility, they, 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 the church preaches the true Christ. And the true Christ is the guide, the source of life and the guide to life. I believe that. I believe in the desert, but I also believe in the leadership of the prophetic voice, whether it's Moses or the church. I believe in the church, just as the Jews believed in Moses, trusted him, sometimes rebelled. I got a little of that in me too. But they followed him across the desert, and I followed the church, who is Christ in the world, wherever she takes me. They took me into my religious life and all the rest, but I, irrespective of that, is that the church is the incarnate wisdom of God active in the world. She is, in a sense, the primordial Moses as guiding us across the desert. I mean that. I hope you don't leave the church ever. You don't have to like her. And you can get mad at her. They, they used to get mad at Moses. And often the apostles didn't get along. But they got across. They all, in the end, loved Christ and the gay price to the world.